We would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pekani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutsuna First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspot, and Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Hi everyone and welcome back to another School of Public Policy Simpson Center webinar. I am really excited to bring today's conversation to you guys. It is going to be a good one. Uh, today's title is Craft Beer in Calgary, how the scene is brewing. So I mean any chance to talk craft beer we can't really go wrong. Hey and uh, what a better place to do it than from like we said Calgary one of the uh, one of the bigger hubs to do so. So Calgary has one of the highest concentrations of craft brewing operations in the country, but that wasn't the case a decade ago. Changes in policy and regulations have encouraged an explosion of new businesses and products on tap. And with our can-do entrepreneurial spirit, these changes have given rise to some great stories and, of course, great beers. Join us as we are exploring today the story of the brewing scene in Calgary, what happened to make it so success successful, and what do industry players have to say about their experience. So today we are uh, we have actually three panelists. It's going to be a uh, like I said a really exciting conversation. We have John Bailey, who's a research associate for the Simpson Center for Agricultural and Food Innovation and Public Education. Brad Goddard, who is the director of business development and government relations at Big Rock Brewery, and Brendan Barnett, who is the founder of 88 Brewing Company. Before we get into today's presentations, just a quick couple of housekeeping items. This, of course, is recorded. You will be able to find this webinar if you have to duck out for whatever reason, or if you know somebody else on the webinar that can't make it till partway through. You can catch this whole thing. It'll be uh, up on our website as well as, I believe, our YouTube page. So, Please check that out at the School of Public Policy, um, and we will be, uh, like I said, we'll be really excited to uh, go through this. So it, it will be a Q&A session at the end. Uh, we will have our presentations go back to back to back, but if you have any questions during the presentations, I know sometimes it's easy to have a question and then forget what you're going to ask, so pop them into the Q&A chat box. Uh, I will be happy to moderate them and get them to uh, our panelists once they are done presenting, and if you have any specific questions for specific people, please let me know as well, and I will make sure it gets directed to the right person. So without further ado, we're going to start with John Bailey. John Bailey is interested in the role of social and interpersonal factors in the creation and implementation of policy and planning with a strong focus on food systems. He has spent years engaged in research, engagement, and direct involvement in a variety of academic, professional, and volunteer contexts. With a master's degree in environmental design and a BA in psychology, he provides a collaborative and interdisciplinary approach to research and policy development that is well positioned to understand the complex issues surrounding food, agriculture, the environment, and fostering resilient communities. So whenever you're ready, if you would like to turn your camera and your microphone on, John, and uh, we can get right into it. Thanks, Kara. That's awesome. I'm just going to share my screen here. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, like I said, my name is John Bailey, and I'm a research associate at the Simpson Center. The Simpson Center is interested in agriculture and policy and how we can support the growth of our agri-food system in a variety of ways. So one of the things we like to do is find interesting stories in our communities and learn from them. And in Alberta, the, in Alberta there's many to choose from. Uh, obviously, today we're talking about craft beer. So this all kind of stemmed out of a conversation I had with my colleague, Josh who's a research associate at the Simpson Center. He moved here over the summer from Winnipeg and was uh, seeking recommendations for craft beer because there's so many styles and types to choose from. So we started talking a little bit about why that was. Uh, I'd done some previous research um, in food system planning in the Calgary region and it came up quite a bit. So 
From there, we decided to put together a project looking at policy and regulatory changes that have contributed to the growth of craft brewing in Alberta um, with some key questions to focus in on. So what's been happening in the craft brewing scene in Alberta over the past few decades, obviously focusing on policy and regulation. What have the impacts been and how have those changes and impacts been perceived by stakeholders, so people in the brewing community and also community members and consumers. Um, so this webinar is sort of, I'll be speaking a little bit to the first question, and then we can get some insight from our guests on the second bit. And also for the project itself, um, this represents sort of the summary of what's happened so far, and next steps for the research include interviewing and engaging with different people and stakeholders, and then eventually we'll report our results uh, and make some policy recommendations. So join us again next year for another webinar with the findings and more discussions about beer. So just for context uh, about what makes Alberta exceptional in this moment, if you asked me a decade ago how many breweries there would be in Alberta, I'd say 10. Now there's over 120, and that is a remarkable rate of growth over a relatively short period of time. Also, the selections available have changed significantly. Pre-1993, which was uh, the privatization of the liquor system in Alberta, you'd get maybe 2,000, 2,200 products uh, maximum if you're in, in a given liquor store. Now we have over 10 times that, and there'd be over 5,000 beer products potentially available to the average Albertan. Uh, and also the products we create are, are, are gaining recognition across the country uh, with Alberta brewers winning awards uh, at the Calgary uh, Canadian Brewing Awards, ranking in the top three in most categories over the past few years. As for the breweries themselves, they're located across the province, uh, north of Peace River to Vulcan and, and everywhere in between. Uh, not surprisingly, the highest concentration is observed in major metropolitan centers, so Calgary and Edmonton. But maybe surprising is that Calgary has almost three times as many breweries currently as Edmonton does. And related to that, Calgary boasts several brewery districts where uh, breweries are closely located and they can collaborate on events and um, uh, advocacy and all sorts of different things. And then how much do Albertans drink? The average Albertan drinks about 70 liters of beer a year. So this little snapshot gives us a sense that uh, we have this exceptional uh, quantity of breweries and it's, it's, it's increasing how many we have. We have uh, a lot of products that are well regarded. This is happening across the province, not urban or rural. Uh, it's kind of everywhere and there's an appetite or a thirst for the products that are being created. So what got us here specifically? Um, if we look back a little bit, we'll just explore this timeline. Uh, to 1985, 1986, this is the founding of Big Rock in Calgary and Strathcona Brewing in Edmonton. These are two craft brewing uh, pioneers in Alberta, I would say, especially in the modern era. Uh, Big Rock was founded by Ed McNally, who at one point was also a farmer, recognizing the value of the ingredients we have in Alberta, but also being dissatisfied with the beer that was on offer. Um, so he went to it and started a company I'm really Happy we have one of the representatives today to speak to that experience. Um, and they've maintained business and grown since then. Strathcona and Edmonton is widely perceived to be sort of one of the original craft breweries uh, in, in Edmonton. Unfortunately, they had to close their doors, I believe in 93. Uh, I think that maybe they're just a little bit ahead of the demand in the market and the market itself wasn't maybe equipped to, to, to service them. 1988, uh, Calgary hosted the Winter Olympics. And this was significant because it brought a number of people into the Calgary region uh, with a different taste for beer, namely Europeans wanting to drink stronger ales and darker beers. And so this allowed Big Rock to leverage the attention and the customer base to really demonstrate their, their product and the potential for their product in Calgary and beyond. In 1991, we see Brewsters arrive in Edmonton. Uh, they were started in 89 in Moose Jaw, but they really took hold in Edmonton. And this is another craft brewing mainstay in Alberta. Um, they still function to this day and they have more locations now. And what else is unique about Brewsters is that they uh, used a brew pub model where any beer sold on site had to be produced on site. And any of the beer that was produced on site, you know, in a related sense, could not be sold out or off site. This was just the way that it was regulated at the time. And so anytime that a Brewsters was open, they'd have to have the brewing equipment and a brewmaster on site. Um, September 1993. This is a pretty significant change. Ralph Klein uh, brought in uh, a full privatization of the liquor retail and distribution system in Alberta. We were the first province to actually do that. Um, and it was you know, sold as a cost saving measure and it had a lot of impacts, but related to our project here, it had two significant impacts. One being it opened up the market to what, um, what was coming into the 
Alberta region. And so consumers could become used to and access a wider range of beers, styles of beers and kinds and so on. And also it laid the groundwork for the development of a private market around alcohol and liquor in Alberta, which came in handy later on, as we'll see. And then in the mid nineties, uh, Alley Cat was founded in Edmonton and Wild Rose in Calgary. And again, these are just great examples of early entrance into the craft market that had the staying power throughout this time that are still functioning and that have provided you know, a few generations of brewery enthusiasts and craft beer enthusiasts in those areas, good beer and experience. Jumped ahead about 20 years, uh, 2012, maybe early 2013, I couldn't quite lock down the time. Alberta Small Breweries Association formed, and this is a group of like-minded individuals uh, in the brewery sector that just wanted to be able to advocate with a common voice for what they needed to have done. Also in 2013, Olds College, which is an agricultural college um, just north of Calgary in Olds, they started to develop a program for brewmasters and brewery operation management. Their inaugural class came in in fall of 2013, which was pretty lucky, uh, or maybe just serendipitous, as in December of 2013, Arguably one of the most significant changes that we've noted um, was deregulation. So uh, the Alberta government basically removed the requirement, uh, minimum brewing requirement of about 500,000 hectoliters in order to receive a license to be brewing beer in Alberta. With that gone, you could brew as little or as much as you wanted, as long as you can meet the other requirements needed to get a license. Uh, and this was a, a, a big change, a big barrier to entry identified by quite a few people. In addition, uh, they also removed um, the restriction on selling beers and, and products produced in beer, brew pubs so that it could be sold in retail centers. Um, and then they also addressed some of these lingering tax issues, which I won't get into too much, but we can explore a little bit more after as we go through a few more tax changes in this timeline. Now, the response was immediate to the deregulation with over three new breweries starting up in Calgary in the first year following these changes. And 2017 onwards saw almost 10 breweries start in the Calgary region each year. Edmonton was a little bit slower out the gate with about five startups between 2013 and 2017 and over 10 in the time since then. So pretty significant impact. Uh, move forward a couple of years, excuse me. The Alberta government introduced a lower markup for beers produced by smaller brewers in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and BC. That would be the newest partnership. And this was in response to concerns about the tax markup rate, which had previously been a range of $1.25 a liter for larger capacity producers to as little as 10 cents a liter for smaller scale ones. Uh, they eliminated that and replaced it with a flat tax of $1.25 a liter for all breweries, regardless of location, but with the grant program to offset the cost for smaller scale brewers basically just trying to create space in the market for the smaller scale brewers to open up. But unfortunately, uh, it's slightly picking favorites in a sense too. Now in May of 2016, the city of Calgary made a move to change their bylaws to include brewery, winery, and distillery as a discretionary use category. Previously, if you want to have a brewery in Calgary, it would be in, a, in an industrial area, but the discretionary use change meant that it could be in places where people more often were during the day. And that is one of the contributing factors to why we see these brewery districts now. Um, in August of 2016, the Alberta government uh, rolled back the policy that it previously put in, in October 2015, instituting a markup of $1.25 a liter for all beer. And at the same time, it introduced a rebate for craft brewers in Alberta, known as the Alberta Small Brewers Development Program. And really what this said that if you had the appropriate license and you sold less than 300,000 hectoliters annually, you could receive funding. So again, same kind of concept, create space, but unfortunately when you make these boundaries, um, some people are negatively affected also. June of 2017, there was a few more changes that the Alberta government put through. So simplified licensing process for tap rooms and the ability to sell craft beers at the proof farmers markets. In July of 2017, um, the Alberta Small Brewers Association, in concert with the Calgary Stampede, were able to serve beer from 23 Alberta breweries at that Stampede event, which is a really, you know, big sign of how far things have come, and also sort of harkens back to the roots of the Stampede as a, an agricultural centre, and one of the founders, A.E. Cross, has a history in Calgary Brewing also. Uh, in September of 2017, the City of Edmonton approved changes similar to Calgary, to their zoning bylaws to include breweries, wineries, and distillery use which is good. Um, now in 2018, there was a couple sort of landmark rulings that impacted these previous actions. So in May of 2018, stemming from an internal 
complaint regarding uh, trade violations. It was ruled that the markups on out-of-province beers violated the internal trade agreement and were required to end within six months. In the same year in June, um, the, the, the rebate program itself in concert with some of these uh, prohibitory policies were ruled to be unconstitutional. And the Alberta government was required to pay out over $2 million in damages to out-of-province groups that had suffered from this. On a lighter note, in July of 2018, uh, Klondike Days in Edmonton uh, served beer from 27 Alberta breweries and it's my understanding that it was exclusively Alberta beer. And then moving forward from there, 2018 saw some minor changes to allow liquor sales in barbershops and salons and the easier delivery of alcohol. And then the uh, newly elected UCP government in 2019 pledged to address some of these interprovincial barriers for beer. So really quickly, just thinking about the connection to agriculture, agriculture is foundational in Alberta, I would say culturally and as a sector, and beer is and always has been a big part of that story, partly because Alberta has high quality barley and wheat. Um, and recently we've seen hops production also scaling up in response to demand. And so related to that, um, aside from primary production, secondary industries are growing also. So obviously brewing itself is a value added exercise and processing related to things like malting or taking extracts from hops in order to use for brewing. And then things like uh, tourism and marketing also. And with this in mind also, there's this local push that we often hear about increasing demand for local products, local producers, understanding how your purchase has an impact on the local system and buying beer that's produced locally using local ingredients is a very tangible way of achieving that. Also from a brewer or producer side, local markets are often easier to access than even other provinces, with some brewers saying it's easier to sell out of the country historically than it is to sell to other provinces. So stemming from this, a few opportunities for growth, one to produce more or to produce different ingredients regionally um, based on the demand coming from the brewers, another to increase capacity or scale of existing operations if it could be done so sustainably, uh, redirect waste products and waste streams. So that could be from brewery operations to farms as feed and other, um, ways to use it and also from uh, different centers and as diversion to actually brew beer, for example, like day old bread. Um, and then also through collaborating, producers can find efficiencies and share knowledge in their own operations and also identify new customers by collaborating on beers, activities and so on. So for my final slide, just a quick summary of some of the parent factors that we could pull out of this, of why it's been so successful in Alberta. One, the opportunity that was presented by deregulation opened up space for this to happen. Um, there was this latent capacity in the province of a largely young and risk tolerant population, well acquainted with like entrepreneurial culture. There was an enthusiasm uh, for the product, obviously, but also for the process of building something up out of nothing, essentially. And the resources required are here. We have the water, high quality water, barley, wheat. We can make the malt. The specialization provided by the old brewmasters program um, has proved really essential to creating high quality beers and also exposure to operational experience and, and the industry via the find out foundational actors. So those early breweries and the one since, and also the old program, which really emphasizes that there was uh, an, an availability of capital. We could say that relates to a downturn in the oil and gas sector around the time that this was happening. There's been ongoing support in different forms from community. Uh, collaboration within industry, and as we've seen, government has attempted in different ways to lend support also. And finally, um, quality. I mean, we brew good beer, and that's maybe the most important part. So with that, I'll say thank you for your attention, and I'll pass it along. Thanks very much, John. That is, uh, it's an interesting timeline, and I like how you, uh, how you outlined that all because it's, uh, yeah, it's it, it's a story I think a lot of people aren't really aware of. So thank you very much for sharing that. Up next, we're going to have Brad Guttard. He is a seasoned veteran of the Canadian craft beer scene, having spent 12 years of progressive leadership experiencing starting in operations, then overseeing all aspects of opening new markets for steam whistle brewing in British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. 
In 2013, he transitioned to one of Canada's oldest independent craft breweries, Big Rock Brewing, and was part of the team who expanded commercial brewing capabilities by developing assets in British Columbia and Ontario. His current focus at Big Rock is business development and advocacy, is a director of the Alberta Small Brewers Association, where he serves as chair of the policy committee, and is chair for the Coalition of Canadian Independent Craft Brewers. So whenever you're ready, Brad, take it away. All righty. And uh, to reiterate some of the stuff John said, there is that entrepreneurial spirit, that kind of X factor that exists in, in Alberta, along with the being located very close to beer's best resources, which are great water and, and barley and wheat. It really has developed quite a unique culture. When I look at across Canada, Alberta is a leader in, in beer policy, but it doesn't mean that it's without its bumps. Uh, Western Canada in particular is unique in the Canadian craft beer landscape. It has some of the largest and some of the oldest continuously operated craft breweries in Canada, despite some people thinking that Ontario, Ontario and Quebec really are two big volume drivers. Their craft beer culture stalled in the 90s, right when um, Alberta was starting to find its feet a bit more. I think the big difference at that moment in time, what helped Alberta craft beer scene get over that hump that crushed the craft beer scene in the 90s in Ontario was privatization. When you have to audition uh, through the provincial liquor boards, which are really like these cartels that operate in every other province of the land, it is a high stakes game of that magic golden ticket of, of yes onto the shelf. And it is unbelievably challenging, particularly for, as brewers try to get into Ontario from other places in the land or any of these other uh, provincially operated liquor regimes. And with Alberta, Alberta brewers could go to independent liquor stores. There wasn't that sole point of distribution where if you didn't win there, then you were busy trading out of the trunk of your car. And I think that's what allowed Alberta to survive and thrive and grow when really the rest of the nation, except maybe BC to a degree, um, craft brewing collapsed. And then you get into the 2000s and, and kind of the, the second renaissance of craft beer. What dominates some of the landscape is to a degree still, but less now than it has, is size politics. And that's where Big Rock has a unique perspective on this. Um, craft brewers used to define themselves uh, by a couple of things. Uh, all malt, which largely is a challenging message for consumers. They don't know what malt is, it's barley and wheat. Um, that we were small and that we were unpasteurized. And then when you look at the craft brewing scene today, mm, craft brewers aren't small, not in the way that they were in the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, they're using other ingredients, other adjuncts, in order to make new and exciting beer styles. And a lot of them, as they've moved into hazy IPAs and, and working with fruits, have wanted to start seeking out pasteurization. So craft beer has um, perpetually this identity crisis of what is craft beer. And, and customers, consumers are always asking us, what is craft beer? Is Big Rock craft? And, and one of the things that now defines craft beer is less these, these boxes that we put around the industry. You don't pasteurize. You have to be small. And more what we do in our communities and and the principles that govern our business and the products we make. You know, you make a, a great quality product instead of, and when you add adjuncts, it isn't the presence of adjuncts that used to be a no-no for craft beer. It is the intention behind the adjuncts. If they're used as a part of a consumer experience rather than a cost-cutting measure, then they're allowed in our philosophy. And so craft's rules have really been quite dynamic. The size politics we worked through in Alberta quite painfully in 2015 through to, to 2018. And that is, you, Big Rock is unique in, what, in our size, right? We're, we're over 200,000 hectoliters. And apologies, that's a, a bizarro metric measurement, but it's how brewers talk. It's 100 liters. Uh, and that size is so much different than a lot of our peers in Alberta. Um, you know, the next closest craft brewer is probably around 20,000 hectoliters. Now, Alberta has many more craft brewers that are kind of above 2,000 hectoliters in a lot of other provinces. Um, and that presented a challenge for us in 2016 when the government embarked on some, some trade war tactics by, by limiting uh, where a product could 
could be from in order to get a preferential beer markup rate, and then ultimately making a flat rate for all beer at $1.25, and then backing into um, truing up craft brewers in Alberta with a, with a grant, which was pretty tough. Through that time, um, uh, when, when there was no craft beer markup definition, uh, and even when they put one in place at 50,000 hectoliters, which was below, intentionally below the major Ontario interlopers, uh, one year, in fact, eight months, it cost Big Rock $6.5 million and nearly put us out of business while we were caught in the middle of a trade war. Trying to be a good corporate citizen, we weren't railing against the province the way uh, some craft brewers from outside Alberta were, but uh, it was easily the hardest day I spent in craft beer as we terminated 20% of our workforce in order to triage the business uh, and, and survive. It is a very challenging, it's the biggest challenge I've ever had in beer is, is pivoting uh, on a 125% markup increase, which markup is one of the top inputs that go towards the cost of beer. Uh, between the provincial and the federal government, it is you know north of 40, 45% of the cost of beer on the shelf. And so navigating that and ultimately getting us back to a place where Alberta now defines craft beer at 400,000 hectoliters, it is a model in Canada for the definition of a craft brewer, which now Saskatchewan and BC have adopted those same measures. It's surprising that some other provinces haven't followed suit, but I now know that our position is to go to a million hectoliters. Craft beer and value-added agri-food is a major opportunity for growth. We control only 15% of the market share, but we are 100% of the job growth. We're 100% of the local investment or 98% of the local investment. We're a huge driver, and now that we're finally organized, we are speaking with a more consistent policy voice. But uh, the policy around alcohol, while it is great in Alberta, still has room to improve. And we can kind of get into that uh, a little bit later on today, but there are some, some great opportunities still, even in a province that is a model for all other provinces when it comes to uh, liquor manufacturing and the distribution of liquor. There's nobody that does it better than Alberta. Is that, that's a good, that's good, eh? You don't need any more from me at the moment. <laughs> Whatever you're comfortable with, but that, that was, that was a great uh, summary for sure. We'll, uh, we'll hand it over to Brendan next, but uh, there'll be opportunity to chat some more. Absolutely. And I see your questions coming in. So thank you very much. Keep them coming. And uh, we're going to have a great uh, discussion coming up here soon. So next up, last but not least is Brendan Barnett, and he's the director of operations and co-founder of 88 Brewing Company in Canada's Ramsey neighborhood. Inspired by the spirit of the 88 Olympics, 88 Brewing Company opened in August 2018 and continues to celebrate diversity and inclusive inclusivity while showcasing our great city. 88 Brewing's goal is to spread good vibes, rad times, and great beer. So on that note, Brendan, take it away. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, everybody. Really appreciate it. Uh, obviously, it's kind of uh, fun to be the opposite end of the, of the spectrum as Brad and Big Rock. I think it, it, it's kind of good to see the two different types of breweries. And so I think the, the three things I wanted to talk about were just that is kind of the business models of breweries in the province, how they're affected by the policies, maybe talk about three of the policies that John highlighted, and then a few things maybe go forward for us uh, would be good. So uh, I really appreciated uh, seeing the 1988 uh, Olympic shout out in the timeline of key events in Alberta. Obviously, that's a big part of uh, the brewery and our aesthetic, but just kind of want to talk about it like the waves of craft breweries in the province, right? So obviously, Big Rock, your Wild Rose, your Alley Cat, your Brewsters, they're all kind of the pioneers and like the wave one. Um, and, and for us is we didn't even start business planning until 2017. So like I'm not even involved from a policy perspective of trying to even open a brewery until later on in, in the overall discussion there. But we're really, really riding on the coattails and super thankful for the deregulation and the minimum production requirements that happened in 2013, 2014, based on like your tool shed and your dandies, the guys that opened up first is, is those are the people that really opened up the crazy broader craft market uh, explosion, I think that, that you've started seeing. 
Um, and then I like to call it kind of us wave 2.5 in a way. So like, you know, us, Annex Establishment, Cabin, Cold Garden, were kind of all of that explosion that's been happening since. And I, I'm very curious to see if there is a third wave, like what's what's going to happen next? Because it does seem like things are cooling down a little bit. Um, not that there's not a lot of room to, to keep opening breweries, because every brewery has a different different models, whether you want to be a tap room, you want to be distribution, you want to be draft in bars, it, 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 there's a whole bunch of different ways to play it. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how that goes. From, from the presentation John did, I just want to talk about, yeah, kind of three of the policies is, again, that minimum production requirement. Um, I never even thought about it because it was it was taken away before I had even started thinking of opening the brewery. There's, there's four of us that are the founders, I'm one of them. Um, but it kind of is allowing us to catch up to the rest of the world. So I, I really enjoy seeing this framed as an Alberta success story, but craft beer, North America, Europe wide is just, uh, it's, it's in like a unstoppable force. It's such a phenomenon right now. Like I think there's 8,000 breweries in North America and, and the average brewery I believe is between four and five years old. And it's just kind of staggering that this is happening everywhere all at once. And I, I don't know the, the reason why it would take a really long time to kind of analyze, but it's super fascinating. And that that change let Alberta really catch up. Um, the second one in terms of key policies is, is not explicitly highlighted here, but is actually ATB. Like ATB in my head, it's not a crown corporation, but it is sort of an Alberta specific function that operates a lot differently than I think a lot of banks, um, provincial credit unions, all that type of stuff. But ATB is actually, behind the scenes been pushing craft beer hugely. And that's, I know, maybe something different than the pure government policy stuff that's been highlighted here, but it is fascinating because a huge percentage of the businesses are supported by them. And a lot of that is because of the agri component and stuff happening behind the scenes. So ATV has been super helpful for us. I just kind of want to give them, I guess, a shout out maybe. Um, yeah, and then the third one is on in the agribusiness side is um, Alberta, there I think is, is super uniquely positioned with the, the super high quality malt barley that we, malting barley that we can make is it's been, you know, sought after by craft brewers in the US since the 90s. Like what Brad was saying, just because of its, its, its quality, it was some of the first stuff where people were trying to contract it and buy it, you know, Lagunitas in California and stuff like that in, in, in the 2000s were trying to buy our stuff here before we even had that huge craft movement. Um, and I think, again, Alberta catching up is super useful. It is, is beyond just vertical integration. There's like Alberta barley, there's uh, Alberta tour and Calgary tourism. It's, it's a great story to tell. It, it adds way more jobs to the economy. The fact that you can really actually truly grow grain to glass here, not that that's a policy, but it's something that the government is obviously catching on to and would be silly not to continue to just lean into that as hard as humanly possible. Um, the last one I just want to talk about is, yeah, trying to do everything in threes here is, uh, Policy changes for us go forward. Maybe this is too minutia for everybody, but um, I think a big one is that there's a really weird warehouse market. Warehousing distribution in Alberta is um, vastly majority controlled by Liquor Connect. There is sort of a lot of regulatory hurdles on things that breweries can and can't do. Um, we can only self-distribute, we can only have certain facilities, we can't team up with other breweries. There's there's a lot of stuff there that I think could really open up the market and continue expansion and collaboration in breweries on like a very technical moving of product kind of way. Um, the second one is still, Brad, Brad was right that the, uh, I think overall the policy framework in Alberta is really good, um, but the minutia of payment processing and just cutting red tape and dealing with the AGLC, there's still, a huge amount there is people forget that that beer is a controlled substance. I love saying that because it makes me feel like I'm a gangster, but is is that there's a lot of fingers in the pie and there's a lot of excise and there's a lot of rules. It's not like selling juice. It's not like selling candy. Is is it the government is slowing the, the flow of commerce? And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and the third one is this is my last point, and then I will shut up. Is uh, policy changes just anything that supports local? And and I think. Um, that can be event, event spaces, like even the government uh, had a thing lately about um, being, yeah, being open to event spaces for food trucks even is useful for us. Um, open container laws I'd love to see, I think. Yeah, there's lots of opportunity to go forward. So yeah, I'll kind of choosh now and keep on keeping on. 
Awesome. Thank you very much, Brendan. We're getting a couple of questions here. Everyone's wondering what you guys are all drinking now. I know Brendan and Brad, you guys both have a drink. Uh, what is it? I'm drinking Power Wheels. It is a Mosaic Hazy IPA. I was drinking Trad, one of the, uh, we brewed Trad for 37 years straight. It is still a pretty good dad beer. John, you got anything on the go? Yeah, I got a wit from Two Pillars, which is pretty close by here. Awesome. Okay, so moving into some of the questions here. Um, one of the questions coming in is how did COVID, I, I'm, I promise we won't stay too much on COVID, but one of the questions is how did COVID impact the opportunity for sales or lockdowns? Like, like do lockdowns impact your guys' sales or in on the other side of things that you found people are drinking more at home? I can kick her off there, Brennan. Um, a lot of craft breweries, 50% of their sales are draft. And, and when, when lockdowns happened, uh, a lot of that beer basically gets stranded in kegs and then goes bad. Or restaurants and bars that close down try to return full kegs or, or will keep, the full ke keep tapped kegs and then try to serve them to mitigate their loss. So that was very challenging. Because Alberta has got a, such a well-developed de distribution network, um, the major challenge I think a lot of brewers faced was getting enough beer in cans to fill that supply chain. And, and a lot of smaller brewers rely on mobile canning and that just uh, the, the ability to, to access mobile canning or put beer in cans was extremely stressed. So, so we were having this great, it was like drinking from a fire hose. We were having great pull, but then we were having a tremendous difficulty to supply the market because the path to market for a lot of our craft brewers uh, who haven't invested the capital to have their own can lines, they're really not, they're pretty dependent on somebody else's schedule. So it's good and bad. The, the one observation I have is Alberta was maybe the one province that didn't see a massive boom in, in e-commerce. A lot of craft breweries did take up e-commerce and it was, was good. Ontario saw maybe some of the biggest boom in that. Their distribution network is maybe a quarter of what Alberta's is in terms of points of distribution just for retail. And so, and consumers started freaking out saying, oh my God, both these retail channels in Ontario, the LCB and the beer store are union controlled shops. They're going to get shut down. They abbreviated hours. They clamped down on, on uh, capacity. And so home delivery e-commerce in Ontario really shifted that market profoundly. And it has forced them to respond with some regulatory changes that if COVID hadn't happened, brewers wouldn't have that tool in their toolkit. And so in one way, COVID really did help open Ontario up a little bit. I don't think we experienced the same here in Alberta. And, and Brendan, you might have a slightly different perspective. You guys did some e-commerce, eh? Yeah, we did a lot of home deliveries, actually. Luckily, look, we're obviously smaller than, than Big Rock, is we actually, when the shit hit the fan, we're able to convert tap room staff into delivery drivers. We bought like an online logistics software and we're doing people just all over the city on the map. So like March, April, May of, of 2020, um, other than yeah, just having a hard pivot to cans is we were able to continue to kind of talk to the customers in a different uh, sales channel. And I think that's kind of always been a big thing for us is being able to have that versatility. We were already pushing into cans. We wound up getting our own canning machine in uh, November of last year. Uh, we had to like, you know, sell enough cans to buy more machines to make more cans. But um, the interesting one about, about uh, COVID was also choice, right? Is if you go down to a lot of like your ye old local neighborhood pub, the line, the tap lines are often you can only get certain products, right? Like you can only get Rickards Red and Shock Top and, and Molson Canadian. But if you're stuck at home and you're you you kind of not having a great time, maybe you're gonna try that local craft brewery that you're like, hey, well, screw it. I, I'm not constrained anymore. I may as well buy whatever I want. And I think it did help the lo the local market overall. So I think in that regard, there was some wins for craft breweries for sure. Absolutely. You didn't so find a good choice for dealing with stale beer and kegs though. We never really, we worked as an industry and some people thought, well, maybe we can distill it, turn it into hand sanitizer. And they're just, it never really scaled to, the, to recover those losses. And then the volatility of it, you, you keg beer and then this, they open up and you don't know when they're gonna open. And so you're trying to keg beer and get it to the shops. And that was a bit of a, a gamut, but 
boy, this is interesting from a from a, a craft beer standpoint. Well, and then on the flip, you don't know when they're going to open. You also don't know when you're going to close again, too. So, uh, yeah, that I could see how that would cause some some difficulties for sure. Um, a question coming in here: It says, for the most part, there haven't there hasn't been craft breweries in the suburbs other than the odd brew pub. For example, in the southwest east part of Calgary, there's a large population base, but the brewing district ends a long way north. Does the panel have any comments on why this is so, and this is a Latin opportunity in larger centers such as Edmonton and Calgary? I can speak quickly for the, the oh, we're all so excited to talk about this, I suppose. I would just say that um, the, the, the land use zoning, I know that was a big issue and, and these things don't happen overnight. So when the zoning changes happen and you get discretionary use for breweries, industrial areas aren't really close right in with the residential areas. And so um, you have to apply for a discretionary use and then it has to be approved and then you have to go through the process. So it just takes a bit of time, but I would anticipate in the future seeing more of the, of the breweries out where people are too. I think that's, the, that's a good approach. As I was going to say the type of building is, is like we, we have like a 10 inch concrete slab and 32 foot ceilings and we're lucky enough to be right beside Ramsey and like a 10 minute cab ride from downtown. But we looked at a lot of spots where it's like super fun, funky heritage building or a brand new kind of more condo building. It's not going to work. Like you need to be able to get semis in and out. You need to be able there. There's a lot of real logistics. It's like if you want it to be a brewery of scale, it, it's very hard to build it in not fit for purpose industrial building. Brad, do you have any extra comments on that? No, that is all very true. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, so a question here, how much of Alberta's microbrewery production is exported both within Canada and to other countries? John, maybe you have some comments on that? <laughs> I actually don't have those numbers. I, I recognize that uh... I think that actually Brad said 15% of the market share in Alberta is held by small brewers. I thought it was closer to 10%. Um, that's pretty much all I've come across as far as export volumes, but um, that is a good question. I'll say, I'll say it's sweet FA. The, the tables are tipped towards Alberta because we're an open market. And so Alberta has this embarrassment of riches that John touched on an unbelievable, un, unparalleled in Canada. There's no place in Canada that has a greater selection of all types of alcohol, including craft beer. And it's because it costs you very little to register and send your beer up to Liquor Connect. Um, whereas every other province, it is uh, challenging if you don't have a manufacturing license in that province to enter that province. And then it's also challenging to, to, to make any money. We're pretty high cost, Big Rock or 88, we're, we're a pretty high cost business just to get it out our front door. And so then to get it to another province or another country is, is challenging. Um, and it's not for lack of effort. The, the province of Alberta spends a lot of time in treasury on trying to export uh, Alberta beer. Um, tariffs coming down, like Big Rock at one time sold a fair bit of beer and had a brew pub in Korea. And what brought that all in for more than a decade and what it brought, brought it all to a crashing halt is we'd found a way to navigate to a degree uh, the tariffs and then the U.S. negotiated a tariff removal on packaged beer about four years prior to Canadian tariff on packaged beer coming off. And the American craft beer just went in and, and took over Korea and our 10, 12 year business uh, plummeted. And so it, it's, it's more just, uh, you know, it isn't for lack of effort. Alberta, the province of Alberta spends a lot of time and commits a fair bit of resources to trying to build trade trade junkets for Alberta brewers and it's just it's pretty difficult for for beer beer craft beer in particular people want to drink what is local and so there's this ethos that doesn't really fit uh export super well and I know selfishly when I go to when I go to Colorado or something like that I'm not dying to drink a trad I want to drink something local and that is makes it tough to travel but even interprovincially it's nearly impossible uh, to, to sell beer outside this province. And we've tried a number of different ways, including building commercial breweries in other provinces. And those other provinces still look at you as some Alberta bastard uh, coming to steal market share from Ont Ontarians or British Columbians. And then they just don't, the way they control their marketplaces, they just don't list you. It's corrupt. 
Well, it's an interesting point because yeah, I know a lot of people that they'll do that too, right? You go traveling and what do you do? You they'll they'll surround it around testing different craft beer, but as much as you might love Big Rock, you're maybe not going to drink it when you're in Colorado. So uh, yeah, absolutely. I see where you're coming there. Uh, a, an interesting question here. How would you characterize the competitive atmosphere between breweries? There seems to be a trend towards each brewery offering a full slate of multiple varieties rather than specializing, for example, IPA, lager, and sour, et cetera, instead of specializing with multiple sours. Does this indicate that they are all trying to compete along multiple product lines, but they, are all, they also seem to be a high degree of collegiality and potentially cooperation among breweries? What, I mean, maybe Brendan and Brad, you guys have some thoughts on this? Yeah, coll collegiality is great. I don't have that one in the, in the thesaurus to use that when I talk about the whole collaboration spirit, but it's super real. Like mm -hmm. we share ingredients. We like somebody from somebody other brewery is here once a week because we're short a bag of hops or wheat or yeast. Like we're all still so small that, that, that there's no real competitive aspect. On the beer style, part of it is about telling a story. It's like we, we always talk to our staff is that your convert, someone who shows up and they're like, I saw your beer on Instagram. It has strata hops. I want to try it. They're already there. The person that is like, I'm such and such as uncle and they made me come to this tap room because I'm visiting from Strathmore. If you can start them at the lager and then have them maybe try a dark beer and then maybe try an IPA and then maybe a sour, that's also part of it too. And just showing off that like the brewers have chops is if everybody just, if we just made hazies, I think the brewers would get tired about it. So I think, I don't know, variety is the spice of life to a certain degree. You can do it both ways though, is like, if you think about a brewery like um, like Brewery Far down in, in Turner Valley, like they really focus on say three core products that are badass and they get international recognition for it. So you, you can still play it both ways. It doesn't always have to be the, the whole ki kitchen sink approach, so. It's interesting, Greg Zeschek up in Edmonton, he's got, he's gone both directions at once. He has a place that specializes in sours and a place that specializes in lagers. And for probably the reason that Brendan said, you've got to give people a wedge in, you've got to make it a, a, to a degree accessible or familiar. Because somebody's not going to go right from Coors Light to a hazy IPA, even though they might enjoy it. It is, it's a long way for some people until they say, like, some people just won't put it in their mouth until they're tricked. So you gotta, you gotta lead them there. Uh, yeah, a term I saw come up quite a bit, maybe Brad knows a little bit about it too, <clears throat> excuse me, is co-opetition, right? And I've heard that used quite often about how it works in the, the beer scene. We talk at, at ASBA meetings you know, certainly when we talk about trying to get market share for Alberta craft and, and Alberta product in every fridge, we only have 15% of the market share. Like we're not church mice fighting over crumbs. There are two very, very large targets and we need to spend our time at all of our different points of distribution. That's the beautiful thing about craft beer is there's one in damn near every small town in Alberta. We need to each do our part to pull those other 85% over into our, our sphere because the reality is beer isn't the way it was 15, 20 years ago when maybe our parents were stocking the fridge and they only had one brand. The average consumer, and we did, some, we did do some consumer research on this, the average consumer says they have six brands. I have six brands in my stable, whereas 15, 20 years ago, Coors Light guy was a Coors Light guy, right? A, a blue guy was a blue guy. And there just isn't those walls around consumers that there once was. Six is a lot, but it does mean that... Uh, uh, and certainly with crafts culture of new and now, consumers will pass through your fingertips like sand. You'll get them today. There's no guarantee you'll get them tomorrow because they'll chase that next, they'll chase the strata hop or they'll, they'll chase that next trending style. That is how craft is going to continue to sc scrounge together market share is we can move quite fast to follow those trends. And it is exhausting as a, a business owner, though, to follow new and now. That is it's tough. You got to think of a name. And the boy, the biggest, the, probably the biggest saturation is not the number of craft breweries. It is the number of uh, beer, good beer names. We're saturated with great beer names. There's none left. There's no more good beer names. In the I suppose that's also an argument for having a diverse offering on your taps. If you have a brew, you know, anything so that you can get those grains of sand to come back periodically. Absolutely. Uh, I got to ask, Brad, what's the process? Are you involved in the naming process at all when it comes to naming some of these beers? 
Yeah, my the first beer I named at Big Rock actually was a, a, a policy challenge for the AGLC. It was a Gruet. And the AGLC used to take a very, very Germanic uh, definition of beer. It was the federal definition. A Gruet doesn't have hops by tradition. And so when we made it, uh, we said, oh, get, the, get a load of this AGLC. Isn't this neat? It's, a, it's an old style of beer, an ancient style of beer. It has no hops in it because it predates the common use of hops. It's an English style. And they said, wait a minute, there's no hops in it. You need to destroy that. You're in possession of an unregulated alcoholic product. And we're like, oh my God, how many hops do we have to put in it in order to satisfy your definition of beer? And they said, it just has to have hops. We literally put one nugget of hop in, whoop, satisfied the definition. But a uh, long story, maybe even longer, we called the beer Monk's Misery, which was my name. And it's because monks were one of the top consumers of beer. They're allowed to drink beer even when they're fasting. They're Lenten vows of fasting. You can still drink beer. And uh, Gruets were famous for uh, putting lead in your pencil. Um, uh, and monks couldn't do anything about it. They were drinking all this stuff and it was supposed to fill them full of vigor. And then what are they going to do? Go to Vespers, I guess. So that's why I called it Monk's Misery. So you can have, boy, that is maybe a little pedantic way to name a beer, but it was a memorable name and I like alliteration. <laughs> Absolutely. Brendan, do you have any uh, ones you've named in the past? Oh, yeah. We, we come up with lots of beers. We have quite the list of them. But like, for us, it's, it's, it's easy because they're about 50% uh, like Calgary throwback and they're 50% total throwback, right? So like Wave Pool is, is my favorite beer that we make. And it's because like, why does Calgary have a leisure center program? Like, why are there so many wave pools with the giant swinging balls for kids? There's like four of them in town. I don't know why. I think someone told me that we actually did it to try and compete with West Edmonton Mall, that there was like an inferiority complex there. So I don't know. Yeah, there, we, we got lots of names. I've been to all of them. They're all fantastic. <laughs> It's the Alberta Advantage and giant swinging balls. <laughs> oh, I like that. Oh, a question coming in here. I, uh, this person says, I'd like to hear whether there are any rumblings of policy changes to make breweries able to produce cannabis infused drinks. Is there anything that way? Oof. I don't know if you guys, you guys might know more about it than me. I know that there's like a whole cross contamination thing. The problem is they don't want you to make uh, speed balls that have everything in it. And so it has to be a whole separated uh, production facility is my understanding. That's why we've never pursued it. I don't know, you guys might know more about it than me. And all the security requirements to handle cannabis, like you, you literally have to build a fork inside of your building because there's uh, Health Canada oversees uh, cannabis and it is very different regulations than, than beer. Even though we have to have food safety, uh, cannabis regulations have come from a kind of a different federal entity and it is unbelievably challenging and in really uh, uh, drinking cannabis really has not caught fire um you know it's not like it's uh it's not like it's getting on south of the border it sounds like a great idea but in execution it it just hasn't picked up a lot of steam part of it is probably um the the regulations people who are set up to make these beverage products can't touch cannabis and we looked at it and it was going to be a total nightmare so yeah thank you for your comments there um so another comment here there are so many breweries it must be exhausting for restaurants beer stores etc as one sales after another makes a sales call would your plan panel please talk about the challenges of making the sale to various retail outlets? Now you talked a bit about the struggles, but do you want to just elaborate a bit more on that for us? Maybe Brad, you're smiling. Maybe you got some thoughts. Or well, you, you know, this is, this is a salesman's plight. I like guess knocking on doors is, is our job to sell. I, I, I do get some fatigue from buyers who's, who haven't got more hours in the day as Alberta craft brewers have proliferated. You know, it's where consumers have put some good pressure on retailers to find that time. I see guys like Steam Whistle, which have consolidated with Phillips in Ontario and with Bose, creating um, some strategic partnerships uh, where, where one sell, sell, sales team is selling a portfolio of products is probably where craft beer will edge towards because retailers, especially the key accounts, the, the grocers, which are the ones that make or break craft beer in Alberta, they don't have more hours in the day. And so that it is easy for, it's easier for them to say no than yes. And so I think finding ways to build out your portfolio 
there again, give a little something for everybody, trade in as many corners of that fridge as possible is, is where craft beer is probably going to. And you see guys doing that through some strategic partnerships. It, it dovetails into also the distribution challenges that Brendan said. If you start doing all these direct deliveries, then those retailers then have 50 van, man in a van coming to their gate, which is a total pain in the ass as well. Um, and so uh, that also creates a disincentive if we can get some concessions on warehousing. I mean, I'll tell you, every other province has, well, Ontario and BC have horse shit in terms of policy, except warehousing. They've got great liberties when it comes to warehousing. Alberta hasn't. And the reason is the government owns the warehouse. <laughs> so, so it is the one place where the government still holds an asset and it still behooves the government to create policy that protects the asset. They literally just opened up a brand new warehouse. But that's, you know, one thing is getting it in the front door, walking through the front door. The other thing is receiving it at the back door. The number of craft brewers does present a challenge. If we can get to some portfolio selling or some efficiency there, um, we'll solve a problem that I think retailers have. Brendan, any comments? Uh, just, I mean, for us, again, as being a bit smaller is, is for us, it's all about personal relationships, right? It's like, it's not, it's not cold calling. It's not being that annoying kid pulling on your coattails trying to get in. It's like the hilarious example is like, we just got in at a bar because our new Calgary sales guys in a band and it's a place he used to play at a lot and knows the manager and the manager puts the beer on tap. We go watch the show and drink the beer. Like it's hopefully organic sometimes. And so, and they, we don't know every bar in Calgary. So that same story should happen seven different times for seven different breweries of our scale or whatever. So yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm in operations. So what do I know? <laughs> um, Okay, where are we going to go next? Um, at what point will the city feel saturated with craft breweries? And how would policies ensure their healthy progression through that phase? Does anyone have any thoughts there, John, maybe? You can speak to it without as much personal experience. I would say that um, <clears throat> saturation is a tricky term. Um, are we talking about saturation of operations or, or quality or volume demand? Um, I don't think that we're quite where we could be. I think that per capita, there are provinces that have more breweries uh, per capita. And that's, I'm thinking out East in particular. And so there is still room to grow. Um, as far as policies to encourage that, I think that what we've seen here is there are some um, really supportive policies or levers in place, especially for the early stage operations. So some of the stuff that's been happening already could happen in different forms but just prioritizing, making a little bit of space for them to enter the market. And then some of the other things that we've seen around um, encouraging cooperation. Um, and then also just opening up space. So if there's assets or if they're willing to extend liabilities, anything like that that could happen, that would be beneficial, I think. But, you know, that's my kind of my outsider's perspective. I think if I was opening a craft brewery today my, with my own money, I'd get it in a central location and, and have a business model that just saw me trading out my front door a tap room model. Alberta has extraordinary policy that allows brewers to sell in their tap room. We don't even have to set up a kitchen. We can sell in the tap room so long as we have food available. And 88's actually done a pretty good job of, of using this, responsibly using this tap room policy. I would try to trade out my front door. You enter a world of pain when you start packaging your beer and sending it into other bars and, and inviting all kinds of risks that are out of your control. And and, and I think what's compelling about, and we need craft brewers of all size, because I drink more craft beer. I'm a suburban dad. I drink more craft beer in my driveway than I do in any tap room. But, but I think that's why we won't hit a saturation point is as long as we continue to have different business models coming in. Um, you could have a craft brewery in every community. And as long as they, their aspiration is to make 1200 hectoliters and sell it at their front door, which I think you can do, right? That's pretty easy. You make a great space and and you put it in a, in a great community with some great uh, people and a radius around you, I think craft will just grow. It'll just, I think we'll see more different styles of craft breweries um, than just your traditional, hey, I make beer and I ship it in a, in a can or a bottle or a keg. Okay, 
Okay, uh, before we end off here, another question that I'd like to kind of pose to all three of you. So uh, is, is there any insight into new styles or trends going into 2022? What did, I'm sure you guys all have some perspective on that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's always IPAs. Like IPAs are the fastest growing segment for like 25 years in a row, I think, like starting this year in Nevada Pale Ale till now. It's, but then it's fruited IPAs and it's sour IPAs. But what's interesting is, is what I would say personally for us is then um, people start getting palate fatigue. If you're a craft beer head and you're always drinking 9% imperial stouts and crazy barely sours, you need a Pilsner. The brewers here and myself, we drink more lagers and Pilsners probably than anything else because like a clean, well-executed beer is, is worth its weight in gold. So I think and we're, we're hoping to launch more as well as just like, and, and it applies to the broader market too. That's, that's your gateway beer. But yeah, just clean, easy drinking beers and IPAs. That's my answer. It's funny with IPAs, it's not the 5% IPAs, it's the bookends, the, the bigger IPAs and the lighter IPAs are what's probably trending most right now in the U.S. Is the U.S. has so many IPAs that they have all these sub-segments fruited and all kinds of stuff. And so imperial IPAs and light IPAs are two of the faster growing segments in the gorilla in the room category of IPA. John, in any of your conversations uh, across the industry, are you seeing any trends going into 2022? I think I'll uh, lend support to the perspectives of Brendan and Brad on this one and say that for myself, I do often tend towards the heavier side of the IPA scale if I don't know what to do. So I feel like it's kind of a safe bet. If you don't know what the offerings are, you don't know what you're going to go for, especially for people who are newer to craft beer. That's probably the way to go. So that's my perspective. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you all. This, this went really, really fast. I can't believe we are already out of time. Uh, anyone have any last comments they would like to make? I think, uh, and this one is more of a demographic one. What we're seeing in the States, and I think it'll extend up here, is for the first time in the history of America, legal drinking age to 25, the number of drinkers, beer drinkers, the largest number of beer drinkers was women. They passed men. And I think that's interesting. I think it's culturally quite interesting for beer, which still, even in the craft segment, remains male dominated. Female consumers are, are on the rise and they're on the rise in, in a very key demographic, which um, the male number of drinkers, not volume, men still drink more volume than, than women, but the number of mouths out there, women are now presenting the majority, the, 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 the majority of the mouths. And I think that's a compelling challenge for, for craft beer. Because I think uh, craft beer are the guys to solve uh, the individuals to solve that problem. Good choice of words. The individuals solve that problem. Absolutely, Brendan, John, anyone uh, have any last comments? I'll go. Yeah, my final one is just thanks. Thanks for the interest. I think that's something that's been shocking for me because we've been open for three years in a bit. But like, we had a U of C MBA class come by last week. We have news agencies. We have people reaching out for their projects. It's just like I think the interest in craft and overall education of what it's about is this is this is like a real way to help us and the consumer get better products and us to make better products put in people's hands and so it's just kind of amazing to be part of and I appreciate it so and yeah if, you, if you're in the tap room look out for me absolutely okay John anything else you'd like to add just to echo that that um thanks for for coming and, and joining in to uh Karen Brad and, and Brendan and obviously everybody for attending um, and then we'll move through uh, some more engagement, as I said, and have some probably more robust results. So tune in again for a follow-up seminar next year, and we can talk some more. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you all for your time. And thank you to those of you that tuned in. We would not be able to uh, do this without you. That's what's so fun about being live and having your comments in here. So it's always a great conversation. And if you just, if you just happen to tune in at the end and you didn't catch the beginning, uh, as I said earlier, this is recorded. So check out the School of Public Policy's website or YouTube page, and we will uh, be able to get this to you as well. I believe it'll be emailed out to you afterwards. So tune in and then and uh, if you happen to catch the webinar we did last week i wish you guys all happy holidays because we thought this was the last one but this i promise is the last one of the year so uh stay tuned and uh, have happy holidays everyone and we will talk to you guys in 2022